This episode is sponsored by Masterclass. Though it is really important to know stuff, Masterclass's world-famous instructors show you how to do what's important to you. When I set out to prepare for this podcast almost exactly one year ago, I knew in April 2020 that I needed to get better at writing. That's where one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, came in. Masterclass makes it possible for me and others wanting to improve their writing to take a class from Malcolm Gladwell on writing at our own pace. You can watch and in many cases listen to awesome instructors like Malcolm Gladwell teach you how to do what's important to you. You want to be a better cook? Gordon Ramsay teaches you how on the Masterclass platform. You want to learn how to act? Natalie Portman teaches you on the Masterclass platform. Grow yourself and support Forgotten Wars by trying Masterclass for the year using the link in our show notes. Learn how to do what's important to you from the experts. Now to our episode. This is Forgotten Wars. It was dark on March 28th when Christian de Vette left Brantfort with 1,600 men and seven guns, hunting for small prey. De Vette was making his first move in the new game of chess the Boers had to force the Brits to play if they were going to keep the Boer resistance alive. As long as De Vette could play his much fewer pieces, much faster than the Brits' far more numerous pieces, the Boers could keep far-off hopes alive far-off hopes of foreign intervention, or more favorable British leadership getting elected, or the British somehow losing their will to wage war, the way they had in the First Boer War. After Bloemfontein fell on March 13th, De Vette gave his Free State Commandos leave. Then, on March 17th, Boer leaders in a war council agreed to use guerrilla tactics whenever possible. Those Boers who remained undaunted by recent defeats met De Vette at Zant River on March 25th with renewed courage. Some Boers already were trickling over to fight for the British. De Vette and his 1600 moved northeast at first, but then took a sharp turn south. That way his own men didn't know where they were going. De Vette had set his sights on the Bloemfontein waterworks on the Madère River about 20 miles outside of Bloemfontein itself. 200 British mounted infantry stood guard when De Vette and company left Brantfort. De Vette split his force into two as they grew closer to their target. Everyone was in position at 4 a.m. on March 31st. Christian, De Vette, and 400 hid behind the steep banks of the Corn Sprite, north and south of a drift. Managing 1,200 men and the guns on the slopes east and northeast of the Madeira River was someone who had fought alongside Christian in the war triumph at Machuba nearly 20 years before, someone who served as a progressive member of the Free State Folksrod before the Second World War, but someone who ultimately surrendered to the British in this war, someone who appealed to Christian in a letter months later, to end the war resistance, to think of all the harm this war was wreaking on Afrikaners, someone who Christian said months later that he would shoot on sight. That someone was Christian de Vette's brother, General Peter Daniel de Vette, also known as Pete de Vette. Christian's plan was to drive the British mounted infantry like antelope. Pete's men and guns would serve as the beaters, using gun and rifle fire to drive the British mounted infantry out of the waterworks towards Bloemfontein, across the Corn Sprite Drift, past the railway building, away from any cover, to where Christian and company would lie in wait. Then, just an hour before dawn broke that March 31st, Christian discovered that the British had thrown a huge wrench into his plans. From midnight to 3.30 a.m., Brigadier General Robert Broadwood and 1,800 men 
reinforced the waterworks. If Chris John was going to stay the course, he would be trying to ambush 2,000 men instead of 200. If he stayed the course, he would be outnumbered 10 to 1. So what happened at 6.20 a.m. that morning of March 31st? Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. What happened at 6.20 a.m. is that Pete DeVette's guns thundered from across the Madea River. The DeVettes stayed the course. Fortunately for them, General Broadwood joined a growing list of British generals who failed to send scouts ahead of his main force. Broadwood was more concerned with Olifield's 6,000-man force. But Broadwood knew that force was a safe distance away. His exhausted men had dropped beside their wagons into a deep sleep after that late night march. Some of these men slept less than three hours before the war shells shook Broadwood's force into confusion at 6.20 a.m. African drivers quickly made a dash with their teams of oxen for Corn Sprite Drift. Chris John's men happily swallowed them up without firing a shot. Soldiers captured. Wagons commandeered, drivers captured. Before General Broadwood knew about these quiet captures, he ordered some of his cavalry and artillery units to make a more organized withdrawal down that same path, and then cover the withdrawal of the rest of Broadwood's men. Christian and company captured the first battery unit before it even reached Corn Sprite Drift. One major tailor managed to run back and warn another battery unit and the cavalry unit who were close behind. Just as Major Edward Phipps Hornby started to turn that other artillery unit around, Pakenham paints a dreadful scene. Quote, An invisible wave of bullets splashed the ground all around. Three horses and a wagon team were down. Then the gunner in front of Phipps Hornby was hit in the back. He pitched forward, and another bullet caught him in the head. Now there were riderless horses galloping past, belonging to the men of Roberts' horse, whom Broadwood had failed to send ahead as scouts. End quote. Many Brits fell. Others made it back to the railway station buildings, then began firing on Chris John's position at 8 a.m. Through a hail of war bullets and shells, Phipps Hornby managed to extract five guns and lead a handful of men back to Broadwood's main column. Pakenham picks up again, quote, Phipps Hornby, splashed all over with blood, but unscathed, rode back to Bloemfontein with the debris of the battery. He had three whiskeys and sodas and some sausages and bacon. He was the hero of the hour. Everyone complimented him for his gallantry. He broke down and wept, end quote. Broadwood ordered some cavalry to try to attack Chris John's right flank and circled behind Chris John's position. They didn't make it. Pete DeVette tried to send men across the Mud Air River to attack, but Colonel Aldershot's mounted infantry held them off. When General Broadwood realized his cavalry hadn't flanked Chris John, and when Broadwood began to fear some of his force west of Corn Sprite had been captured, Broadwood ordered a withdrawal towards Bloemfontein. Just after Broadwood completed his withdrawal, Colonel Martyr and Lieutenant General Henry Colville showed up. Too late. Too late to change an embarrassing outcome. In this Battle of Corn Sprite, a.k.a. the Battle of Santa's Post, the Boers suffered only 16 casualties, 11 of those wounded. Broadwood, on the other hand, suffered about 36 times more losses, 
and that's without counting the seven guns and hundreds of horses and pack animals, and 83 loaded wagons that fell into Devet's hands. The Devets took 421 Brits prisoner and killed or wounded about 160 Brits in action. The Times, a British publication, regarded this battle of Cornsprite as Christian de Vett's first and one of his most brilliant surprise attacks. He and his men showed great discipline and courage to follow through on a plan, a plan originally designed for ten times smaller than the force they had ultimately faced. This was the dawn of a new era in this war. Shortly after this clash, de Vett and his men struck again, and this time destroyed the waterworks supplying the town of Bloemfontein. This threw fuel on the typhoid flames that ravaged Bloemfontein. But de Vett wasn't done. After the Battle of Cornsprite, Lord Roberts decided that putting small British detachments in towns all over the southern free state was not giving Boers the impression that the war was practically over. At least, not like Roberts hoped. Major General Gattaker, yes, our man nicknamed Bakaker from before, who forgot some of his men, that Gattaker ordered Captain McWinney to withdraw his troops from Devetsdorp and move towards the railway. Devet convinced about 100 local farmers to take up arms again. Again, because they had just days earlier accepted Lord Roberts's call to lay down their arms. With a few hundred men, Devet attacked 600 Irishmen near Reddersberg, beginning April 3rd. Devet's force swelled to 800 men by early April 4th, where they and a couple guns shelled and shot at McWinney's trapped men. McWinney had requested reinforcements from Gattaker some 20 miles away on the evening of April 3rd. Gattaker's advanced guard got within a mile of Reddersberg, but decided at 10.30 a.m. that it was too late and not worth confronting Devet's forces. Devet's forces had just finished shooting and shelling for about 24 hours before McWinney's force surrendered at 9.30 a.m. that April 4th. The attack cost the British 45 casualties and de Vett bagged nearly 550 more prisoners. Prisoners who would reside behind barbed wire fencing at a nearby farm. General Gattaker's poor decisions here and previously at Stormberg cost him his command. Lord Roberts stripped him of that command a week later. Wherever in the free state that the British hadn't made their presence powerfully known, more Boers took up arms again. As these Boers laid their arms down the first time, they were likely planning to rearm the moment they got the chance. Speaking of chances, de Vett took another chance, this time by trying to bag almost 2,000 colonial troops at Vepiner, These colonial troops were mostly Cape Colony Boers willing to work for the British for five shillings a day. But these colonial troops dug in proficiently with their backs to Basutu land. Though this time, de Vett had 6,000 committed warriors at his disposal, they weren't enough. De Vett's force attacked the colonial line over and over again for more than two weeks, but a 3,000-man Sutu force guarded the rear of Vepiner, so that de Vett's men couldn't simply cross through neutral Basuto land and flank the colonial force. These Sutu supplied livestock and ammo to the colonial force, and evacuated wounded and sick soldiers across to Basuto land under cover of darkness. The colonials at Vepiner voiced awe at the Sutu's bravery. Days turned into weeks, a big lumbering British chess piece from Bloemfontein, led by Ian Hamilton, reached Vepiner, hoping to encircle de Vett's force. But by the time Hamilton arrived, the eagle had flown. We can only wonder how much more de Vett could have accomplished in this early phase of guerrilla warfare if Stain and Creer had wholeheartedly committed a greater share of the remaining Boer armies to guerrilla warfare. If de Vett had more than 1,500 men to consistently count on, he could have cut the railway line that would propel tens of thousands of British troops and supplies where needed. Instead, Stain and Creer clung to the dream 
of somehow halting Lord Roberts's force of 50,000 as it plotted toward the Transvaal. By May 3rd, Lord Roberts readied for a double tiger spring, for him to lead the main army towards Mafeking, and for Colonel Brian Mahan to lead a flying column to relieve Mafeking. Increasingly so, in May 1900, both Brits and Boers seriously considered the war nearly over. Many British liberals and those in the British peace movement began to reflect openly about the end of the war. For example, Sir Edward May began writing a retrospect on the South African War in 1900 and published this book in early 1901. Many political and business tycoons close to President Creer tried to persuade Creer that the war was undoubtedly lost and that peace needed to be made as soon as possible. These men hoped to achieve something other than a humiliating, unconditional surrender before it was too late. Nassen writes, quote, Announcing its action to be under protest, the Republic should lay down its arms and then unilaterally declare the war to have ended. This would cheat Britain of the fruits of complete victory at the last minute and also impose a moral restraint upon any continuing imperial belligerence. This was an ingenious, if odd, stratagem in these circumstances, and it remains a puzzle. It was, at any rate, an indication of the desperate state of Creer's mind that he even toyed with the proposal as a possible means of checking further loss of life and the destruction of resources. End quote. So what happened when Creer proposed this declaring the war over idea to Stain? who, mind you, had dragged his feet as much as he thought possible before getting the Free State into this war. Stain shot this idea down. Stain was all in. Stain wanted to fight for independence at all costs. He had already watched his republic's capital fall to the British. He had sacrificed too much to turn back now. Some wars and foreign volunteers were willing to sacrifice even more. As Roberts rolled towards the Transvaal, the Republican judge, Anthony Cook, former Transvaal state attorneys, Evald Esselin and Francis Wrights, called again for destroying Transvaal gold mines before British imperialists could get their hands on them. American commander of the 1st Irish Brigade, that John Blake we mentioned before, pled with a council of war in the Transvaal for permission to dynamite some mines, but was denied. But Blake found a sympathetic ear from war commander Tobias Smuts, who believed that, quote, the greed of this gold had induced the war. Even President Creer supported using at least the threat of blowing up Johannesburg's gold mines to persuade more mine owners and governments in Europe to put pressure on British leadership but Commandant General Louis Boita firmly denounced this plan as cowardly and barbaric. Boita threatened to bring his thousands of commandos into Johannesburg to defend the mines of Johannesburg if this mine destruction was attempted. Creer then promised not to authorize destroying these mines. Boita threatened to arrest and execute Cook if he went through with his plan to destroy gold mines. But on May 29th, The young Cook brought a band of about 100 German and Irish volunteers to destroy the Robinson mine. They found a stash of gold that Cook thought was being set aside for the British. For whatever reason, Cook went to the town's acting commandant, Dr. Frederick Krauser, and reported this stash of gold. For Krauser, this begged the question, what was Cook and company doing on private property? at the Robinson Mine in the first place. Krauser and an assistant cornered Cook. Cook drew his revolver. Krauser and his assistant still charged Cook and disarmed Cook and arrested Cook. Meanwhile, Louis Boita faced a similar situation to De Vette a couple months earlier. An overwhelming British force continued to close in on Pretoria. Should he use his 6,000 commandos to block the British as long as possible at Johannesburg? 
or be more realistic and avoid being a rock being swarmed by a rushing, unstoppable river. On May 29th, the same day as the aforementioned abortive attempt to blow up some gold mines, the British closed in on Johannesburg. Louis Boita, Cus de la Rey, and company commanded less than 4,000 Boers trying to hold off the British advance at nearby Dwornkwup. If the name Dwornkwup sounds familiar to you, that is because in episode 1.18, you heard about the failed Jameson raid ending in Dwornkwup. Jameson raised the white flag in Dwornkwup nearly five years before. The British provided one of the final set-piece battles of the war at Dwornkwup. Gordon Highlanders charged with fixed bayonets without proper artillery or rifle fire to cover them up a hillside at the Boer positions. They suffered 100 casualties in 10 minutes, but took a hill. A CIV battalion also charged up a hill, but used proper covering fire tactics and suffered only a few casualties. In the face of the overwhelming force of Generals Hamilton and French, the Boers held less than a day before having to retire. Now Roberts faced another decision. Dr. Frederick Krauser was serving as chief prosecutor in Johannesburg and acting attorney general of the Transvaal when the Anglo-Boer War broke out. Creer appointed Krauser in April as special commandant of the Witwaters Rand. Krauser remained in Johannesburg to keep order as Roberts grew closer. Creer and Boita must have been relieved when they learned about Krauser arresting Judge Anthony Cook for his plan to blow up the gold mines before the British arrived. After the Battle of Dornquop, Commandant Krauser made an offer to Lord Roberts. Let Boita's army withdraw intact for 24 hours, and Krauser would surrender Johannesburg May 31st and continue to protect the gold mines. Lord Roberts all along hoped to bring the war to a quick end with as minimal loss of life and gold mines as possible. If Roberts accepted the offer, he could save British lives by avoiding an attack on Johannesburg. Roberts could avoid stretching his troops too thin. Most of those outside Johannesburg only had a day's worth of food left on May 30th. Roberts could avoid street fighting that brought out the worst of some of his troops over a decade before in Afghanistan, where many of his vengeful troops committed atrocities against civilians. The trade-off for accepting this offer would be risking the unknown. How long would this withdrawing war army fight on after losing both republics' capitals? Lord Roberts's decision was quick, and it was arguably, quote, the most serious strategic mistake of his career. Rather than seeking to surround and destroy the armies he outnumbered about 10 to 1, Lord Roberts took Krauser's deal. Buota and company dragged all the mined gold that they could out of Johannesburg en route to Pretoria. Dr. Krauser surrendered the city and soon became a prisoner of war. As British forces marched into Johannesburg, Hundreds of Africans stood on the pavement and cheered, some even burning their passes. Sadly and ironically, the new British administrators didn't change the discriminatory war laws governing natives. Roberts's military government would enforce these pass laws and get Africans off the pavement from which they were technically banned with greater efficiency than the Boers did. All of Joseph Chamberlain's high-minded rhetoric about treating blacks and coloreds better in the Boer republics proved totally empty. Boer forces withdrew from Johannesburg, living to fight another day. Actually, make that living to fight nearly 700 more days. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? 
You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind the mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash forgotten wars. That is patreon.com slash forgotten wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated. Now, back to our episode.